Hello, we're just welcome uh, and welcome, Croiso, for anyone in Wales. Uh, please pop uh, your uh, where you're from in the chat, and uh, we'll get going once everyone's filtered through. It'll take there's quite a lot of us, so it's probably going to take about thirty seconds to a minute for everyone to filter through from holding uh, into the webinar um, session. So we'll just do that. So yeah, uh, please uh, feel free to use the chat, and uh, while you start doing that. I'll just explain a little bit about today's session. So hopefully you're here uh, to find out how to make a mini meadow in your park and garden. Um, I'm very excited to be talking with you about this. Um, if you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A because that means that we can see them. And I've got uh, Felicity who is sitting behind all of the chat who will be able to, uh, she'll be putting some things in the chat, but she will also be looking at all the questions and we'll hopefully have a question and answer session at the end. Um, if you put questions in the chat, we tend to lose them because the chat cycles up over time. So please use the Q&A. The other thing is this webinar is being recorded. Uh, so we're bound to be asked if it's being recorded halfway through as well uh, by anyone who's perhaps a little bit late, but you can go back and watch it again. It'll take a couple of days for us to get it up on the Plant Life video YouTube channel. Um, but once we do, you'll be able to come back and, and uh, watch it. So um, you might find that you're screaming lots of notes if you want to, please do, but yeah, you can also go back. Um, and I say scribbling lots of notes and things because normally we do this type of session over half a day to a day and I have 45 minutes to, to try and uh, kind of give you an idea of how to make a mini meadow in your park and garden. So hopefully everyone has come through from the holding area and thank you for joining us. Uh, so I'm going to crack on with the uh, presentation and like I say put questions and answers, uh, sorry, questions into the Q&A. Uh, if you have any technical problems, please also pop them into the chat and Felicity will try and help you. So uh, please, please do that. Um, so I wanted to talk about, you know, we're here to talk about making mini meadow in your uh, garden park or verge or community space. Um, but really wanted to start off with why is wildflower grassland important? Um, because, you know, we get asked quite a lot. Why should, why should we worry about wildflower grassland and meadows? Um, and I think the first thing to think about is that it is living space for wildlife. It is, it has more plants than any other habitat in the UK and lots and lots of species. Uh, wildlife use of those plants, everything from insects to birds to mammals. And having small patches of uh, well, um, wildflower grassland um, in urban areas uh, and also going out into the countryside and in fields and meadows it, within the rural areas is particularly important because it creates those stepping stones and makes wildflower uh, areas um, permeable. Hi um, Kath, it's Felicity yeah. here. I'm just um, coming over. There's a little bit of chat. There's a bit of scratchiness going Ooh, okay. on from your end. Is that better now? It It is better, I think. Okay, no, that's okay. It's just uh, my uh, mic was catching on something. Thank so you very that... much, Kath. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so... Uh... Um, where was I? Um, so yes, yeah, so uh, living space for wildlife, the meadows are really important for that. They're also important carbon storage areas as well. So species rich wildflower meadows can store up to 30% more carbon than um, species poor grasslands. And that's a massive um, difference for us. If you think about, we look at planting trees and all sorts of other things to store carbon, we can also think of our wildflower meadows in that sense as well. It's really, uh, wildflower meadows are really important for us as well and for our well-being. Uh, and we've particularly seen that during COVID and actually I've got a short film to show you about that. Uh, and they're also really precious space for farming too. So uh, animals that graze wildflower meadows are getting a really varied diet. They get the minerals and nutrients that they need 
and those health benefits are also passed on to us in the products. For example, uh, meat and dairy contain more omega-3 fatty acids, which are the good fatty acids that we want to eat. So I'm just gonna show you this one minute film. So we've actually created several films. They were created for COP26. And if you have a look in the chat, I know depending on what device you're using, whether you're looking at on a laptop or a mobile phone, uh, you might find it more easier or not to uh, see the chat. We've put the links in there so that you can go and watch all of the films. So there's one on carbon and there's another one on bio, um on biodiversity as well. Um, sorry, on well-being. That was the biodiversity one. So well-being, there's a lot of you know some evidence now saying that if you look at a wildflower for six seconds, it improves your state of mind and makes you feel happier. Um, so uh, you know why are we talking about wildflower grasslands? And it's because we've lost a lot of them. Uh, in fact, we've lost around about 97% of the wildflower meadows over the last century, and only 3% of them are species rich. And um, it's, you know, with 160 or more flowering plants in them. And there's a variety of reasons why uh, this type of habitat has um, declined, starting off really within um, the world wars where we needed to increase our food production and um, uh, we started plowing up um, uh, uh, some of our meadows. We also then started to increase production outside of that sorry, um, and overseeded um, some of our uh, grasslands with uh, perennial ryegrass and short-term lays, which maybe contained what, uh, other things like white clover as well. And this ran alongside a shift from traditional, tra traditional haymaking to silage production. Um, we also increased the size of our fields uh, and with modern technology started using artificial fertilizers and herbicides. Um, and the size of machinery has also grown, which has also affected um, the sizes of grasslands as well. And we found that particularly small grasslands uh, were abandoned and perhaps were not managed. And this is also a problem. And the final one is, you know, development. Uh, and we have seen a step up in the amount of housing that we have in this country. And that has taken up wildflower meadows as well. But saying that, we can think about doing something about it and putting some of these areas back as well and thinking about those step in, stepping stones um, uh, throughout our urban areas and into the countryside. So we talk about uh, meadows and we use it as a generic term for uh, different types of grasslands of which I tend to define them as four different types of grasslands. I'll come on to this because one of them isn't always recognized as a particular type of um, wildflower grass. And, and that's because it doesn't contain, necessarily contain wildflowers. So uh, starting off with um, the lower pH, so acid grassland, um, and you have flowers in that like ragged robin uh, and um, uh, spearwort uh, in uh, wetter areas, but in dry grasslands, uh, acid grasslands, tormentil, is a plant that you'll find and also sheep uh, and also sorrel. Um, these are uh, really uh, kind of key 
indicators of this particular habitat. But acid grassland doesn't tend to have as many flowering plants as uh, the other types of grassland. They have lots of rushes, grasses and sedges though. Another key plant that you tend to find in wet acid grassland and wasp pasture and cone grassland is devil's bit scabious, uh, which is food plant of marsh fertility. So very, very important to think about the knock on benefits of having different types of grassland, even though it may not noticeably be kind of full of wildflowers. It depends where you are. Uh, Neutral grasslands are those that are in the middle range of pH and got a uh, picture of oxide daisy there. You also find common knapweed, betony, and of course, yellow rattle that grow in that particular habitat. And it tends to be treated as a meadow, as we think of traditional hay meadow. Calcareous grassland lies at the upper end of the, the um, spec pH spectrum with things like uh, wild thyme, um, and uh, uh, salad burnet, um, and it's probably well, it is our most species-rich grassland of any type in in the UK, um, and it's full of of wild flowers, but it's not necessarily treated as a hay meadow. It's usually treated as a pasture. So I alluded to the fourth um, uh, type of grassland slightly earlier, and that's wax cat grassland, and they may not have lots and lots of wildflowers and grasses in them, but they have an enormous array of wax caps that fruit in the autumn. And for that reason, they aren't always recognized as being species rich. And this is something that we're, we're working with and changing. And if you took part in our uh, wax cap app survey, a citizen science survey uh, last year, um, it was fantastic. We had lots and lots of people join in from across the UK, uh, telling us what color uh, mushrooms they were finding in grasslands. Uh, and as you can see, they can be brilliantly colorful like these red ones here. And you also have other types like uh, the pink ballerina um, wax cap as well. So they are a type of grassland. They can, you know, and wax cap grasslands can also be rich in vascular plants, but they may not be rich and they tend to be managed as grazing pasture rather than necessarily hay meadow. But they can also be managed as hay meadow too. Other places where you find wax cap grasslands tend to be cemeteries uh, and uh, lawns actually in urban areas. So I've talked about what a, a wildflower meadow is. I just want to touch on what isn't a wildflower meadow. And this is where a lot of confusion lies. Um, so wildflower meadows are perennial um, areas of grassland with wildflowers and grasses in them. And when I say wild, wildflowers, I do mean the grasses as well, because of course they are a flowering plant. Um, whereas uh, pictorial or designer meadows, which are filled with cornfield annual plants, aren't really wildflower meadows. They're often termed as wildflower meadows, but they require a very different type of management because the annual plants want to complete their life cycle within a single year. They need to have disturbance of that ground every year to actually grow up and, uh, and to, to trigger the seed to germinate and to grow and then set seed again and continue the cycle the following year. Perennial wildflowers tend to um, grow, they'll form a rosette in the first year and then they'll flower sometime between four, you know, four and five years to many more years, depending on um, the species. So they want to be managed in different ways. Um, and there's a little bit of confusion because we often see in, in urban areas that um, annual wildflower mixes are being used. And then it's a bit of a dis disappointment the following year when of course the plants may not come up or come up as prolifically. You generally have to um, sow some of the, the seeds each year to actually get the, them to come up. Uh, so I've talked about decline and, but I just want to say all is not lost really. Um, we can manage, restore and create wildflower grasslands. And to do that, uh, we will be creating those links and making the area more permeable uh, through the countryside and through our towns and cities, which is really important. That will sequest more carbon and store it in the soil. And it will also uh, support our living landscape and our farmed land landscape as well, and make us 
more happy and healthy. So how do we go about it? Um, and really to start off with this, what makes a wildflower grassland? Because this is the, the key thing really, because this is what we're trying to achieve. Um, so I would start off with the soil and uh, all, almost all wildflower grasslands have low nutrient levels. That's phosphate, potassium, magnesium. Um, phosphate is the particular nutrient that I'll concentrate on. It's also nitrogen as well, but nitrogen tends to disappear quite quickly in certain, um, if certain management's being done. We want to think about soil type and the pH of that soil, because I've already touched on the three different types of, of grasslands that we tend to think about um, in terms of wildflower meadows. And we want to look at the hydrology, how wet the so and, or dry the soil is, and of course, whether there's a uh, seed bank there already. And then moving up above the soil, we want to think about the wildflowers and wild grasses that are there. The vegetation structure is really important. And then the pollinators, the inverte uh, other invertebrates, the mammals and the birds and all the other wildlife that will live on that meadow. And the thing that keeps meadows going is regular management. And that's mowing or grazing. And there is a management cycle that needs to be followed through this. So before we think about how to create a meadow, we need to think about how it's going to be managed once it's created. And as you can see, some areas uh, like this area in, in the picture, which is a roadside verge, can be extremely rich in wildflowers. Um, so what we need to think about in terms of management is annual cutting or grazing. Now, you know, you've come to a, uh, a, a webinar on how to create a mini meadow and grazing probably isn't going to be something that you can really implement on a site like this in an urban environment. So this is about how can you do the same thing that you would do, uh, that the animals might do for you. And thinking about the timing and intensity to remove the soil nutrients and to keep that them low, to keep the vegetation open, which actually facilitates and enables seed set. And of course, a lot of us are thinking here about how that cascades through the systems and the processes. Uh, so provides food for insects and also all the other wildlife as well. And I want to talk to you about the management year for a wildflower meadow. Now, starting off in February, so beginning of the season, we're in February at the moment. Um, and at this time of year, I mean, it's I'm in Somerset and it's been very, very warm today and the grass is definitely growing already. So in terms of management, you actually want to start off with the grass height being quite low. So you might need to do a cut at this time of year. It seems a bit of an odd thing to do to take off the thing that you're trying to grow. But actually, that helps the wildflowers uh, to grow because by taking off a cut of the grass, it gives space for the wildflowers to grow and to come up and bloom. There is a proviso on that though, and that's to do with the plant called yellow rattle, which is an annual. It's one of the few annuals in wildflower meadows that we want to establish. And I'll be coming on to, to um, yellow rattle soon, but it can germinate in February. So it might already be up in some places. You may want to do the cut in March. You of course don't want to cut really wet ground. It doesn't work very well and it can compact the soil. But come April, you will want to shut up that grassland. So this is a traditional hay meadow management. By shutting up, I mean not do any management there. You might, in a more urban situation, perhaps do, you know, cut a regular footpath through it, uh, through your meadow, so that people can walk through it rather than just around it. If you're in an urban area, uh, sometimes actually cutting around the outside of a uh, meadow space can make it seem neater and tidier for people. And actually, uh, if there's lots of issues to do with um, uh, people worrying about uh, the look of areas, that can help improve the aesthetic appeal to those people. Uh, and then um, you leave the area uncut through uh, May. If you're doing no mow May, uh, you may want to do every flower counts at the end of May and see what's in your meadow. Um, 
if you're going to do let it bloom July, uh, sorry, let it bloom June, uh, then you may want to do every flower counts at the end of June. And then of course you want to leave it to knee high July and allow that seed set. And coming in to late July, August time, you'd want to start thinking about cutting that meadow. And there's various ways of doing it. Of course, by then the grass is quite high. So you could think about scything it, uh, but there are other ways of cutting it as well um, with machinery. And, you know, you might want to cut it at different times, which I'll come on to and think about mosaic management. And you could leave the cutting as well, slightly later to September, if you really wanted to. I would always suggest that you want to vary it each year. You don't want to cut at the same time every single year. Sometimes you might, might want to cut it earlier, sometimes slightly later. What you definitely don't want to do, though, is cut before that seed has set. Um, and if it's a really warm um, uh, autumn, you might actually have to cut into September and October. You may also want to rake and pull off the dead leaf litter that is lying at the bottom of the grass. End. And that's because uh, you would want to take uh, move that material to allow seed to get down there. So the normal management for cutting it for a hay meadow cut is to cut uh, the, the grass and wildflowers, row it up, turn it over. So that encourages the seed to um, fall out of the pods as the grass dries. And you would, you know, you'd turn it over actually for, for several days. And that's why you see rows of grass, you know, spun out and then rowed up again and things like that if you were to go into uh, see a wildflower um, meadow. And then, of course, you take all those cuttings away because you don't want to increase the nutrients of the, uh, the ground. And that can be also be a little bit of a problem in an urban area. What do you do with that cut material? Where do you compost it or how do you get rid of it? And then in October, you are probably not, you know, as the weather starts to become uh, slightly uh, cooler, you may not need to cut. Um, I think I, I was reading something earlier on today that said that December was 2.7 degrees warmer than this year, uh, well, last year, than it was the year before. So clearly, weather changes uh, what we have to do each year. And although this is a management cycle, you have to adapt it to conditions. If there's a flood, you won't want to be cutting, for example. Um, you may also in September, October time, depending on what you're trying to do, want to enhance your meadow with yellow rattle again uh, as a way of uh, increasing the diversity and increasing the space between plants, uh, which will allow wildflowers to set seed. So just going back to cons management considerations that you would want to think about is what is the mowing equipment that you have available? Uh, and what are you going to do with the hay once it's cut? You know, is there someone who wants the hay or do you need to find somewhere to um, compost it? And also, what is the manpower available to do this? It can take quite a while and it's quite a skilled job to scythe areas of grassland, but there are machines that can cope with this as well. And um, uh, meadows are more than just plants, you know, we could be talking from plant life. So, um, you know, we look at the plants quite a lot, but we should think about what else is using the grass and, and always think about leaving some food and shelter available. So, you know, in, in old times, it would take us a really long time to cut a farm, for example. Now we can cut a farm in a day or a couple of days if it's really big, but we do it very much more quickly than we used to. And that removes all of the food and all of the shelter and the homes for the wildlife. So you might want to think about phasing management, perhaps even leaving a bank uncut uh, really late into the year so that there, is, you know, there are some flowering plants available there. You might want to leave longer areas of grass so that there's overwintering and hibernation habitat for wildlife. And you would want to move this around each year. So phase it because you don't want to leave anywhere uncut for a number of years. As I said, abandonment is also a reason why wildflower meadows have declined because wildflowers generally aren't as competitive as the grasses. 
and so they start to struggle to come up uh, and and uh, uh, live. And so once an individual plant um, dies, there's nothing to replace it if there isn't the space within that grassland. You may also want to think about monitoring species. So going back to every flower counts, uh, but there's also other ways of monitoring either different invertebrates or different groups of animals. And we're just about to put something on the Meadows Hub about monitoring that will be coming up uh, very shortly, I think. So we've got all that. We want to think about actually now, <laughs> how, how do we um, restore and create uh, wildflower grasslands? And so I'm going to give you a kind of a five step guide, which is drawn out a little bit. So the first thing is, what is your starting point? And so what is the potential of the area that you've been created? Uh, and that really comes down to how that particular area has been managed before. So what was the previous management? Was it a garden? Is it actually a completely new area and it's a flower bed? Um, what's the soil type? So is it clay, sand, chalk? If you're doing this in a flower bed, don't go and buy compost uh, because that's very nutrient rich, which I'll be coming on to. Is it wet or dry? And are there current species? Uh, what are the current species that are there? Um, and that also comes down to outstanding issues. For example, if you have a bank of nettles, that's a sign of high nitrogen. And you may not want to put um, a wildflower meadow there because those nettles will keep coming back. They're very competitive. And to test the soil nutrients, there's two ways of going about it. You can either take a soil test uh, and there are uh, there's information about how to test soil, how to take a soil test uh, on the Meadows Hub, and you can send that off to a lab. But to be honest, if you're looking at a small area, I would get a home testing kit, and you can buy them on the internet or at garden centres. And you want to buy one that looks at phosphate, potassium, and magnesium in particular. And I would also do pH as well, so that you know um, what the uh, alkalinity and acidity is of the soil to help you to choose your species. And the nutrients you really want to look at is phosphate. So phosphate binds with the soil, particularly clay soils actually. Um, uh, more free draining soils, that phosphate can disappear over time. High phosphate levels encourage grasses in particular, but also the more dominant um, uh, plants um, and wildflowers that can then crowd out other species. So uh, this is, you know, to create a wildflower meadow, actually you need to keep on top of the grass. That's the really big thing that you, you need to do. Um, and if you've got high phosphate levels, that really can uh, affect what plants you can establish. So you want to choose your target species. So that depends on the soil type, whether it's free draining, clay, uh, and also on how wet the soil is or not. And all wildflower grasses need low nutrients. So they want low phosphate levels. Normally we suggest, so phosphate is measured on an index um, and we would normally suggest that you want an index lower than two to create a wildflower meadow. But there are some wildflowers that can cope with medium fertility. So if you've got a uh, phosphate level uh, of, uh, you know, two to three, um, and maybe even the bottom end of four, uh, you could think about using those plants as well. So things like oxide daisy, common knapweed and self heal can all survive in that slightly richer soil environment. The other plant that you would, might really want to establish is yellow rattle. So I said before, yellow rattle is an annual plant. It wants to complete its life cycle within any given year tends to germinate in uh, February, uh, particularly on south facing um, areas. Um, and uh, the reason why you may want to establish it is because it's a uh, hemiparasite. So although it's got green chlorophyll in its leaves and it makes its own energy, it also parasitizes most grasses, but not all grasses, but a good fair number of them. And that creates gaps within the vegetation structure, which allows wildflowers that are less competitive than the grasses to grow and, and for those seeds to germinate. So establishing yellow rattle is usually a key thing. There's 
It does have one issue though, it doesn't like shade. So although it parasitizes grasses, if those grasses grow too quickly, they shade out all the seedlings and then they don't come to anything. So you do need to keep on top of that grass, which is where the cutting comes in earlier on in the year, because that can allow yellow rattle to actually seedlings um, to, to kind of get away and grow with the grass and then parasitize them. So we've chosen the seed and now we need to think about actually how we're going to create the wildflower meadow. So I've talked about soil nutrients a little bit. If you have high soil nutrients, what can you do to reduce them? Um, well, the easiest way is to do a frequent cut and removal of that grass um, and uh, just take it away, take it off site because you don't want to leave it there because it will rot down back into the soil. Um, that can take quite a long time, but it is a really useful thing to be able to do and it does work if you've got the time to do it. Um, for topsoil, you can strip it. Now, we wouldn't suggest this over massive areas. And of course, if you are in an area which has any underlying archaeology, we wouldn't suggest it at all. But as you can see in the pictures here, they have stripped the topsoil and stripped the turf from the area. Now, stripping topsoil is actually taking off the top um, kind of uh, five or so centimetres, it depends how thick the topsoil is, um, and removing that as well. So it can be quite a time consuming process to do that, but it can be done over smaller areas. If you are doing this in planters or flower beds, which might be the only space that you've got available, and it's still really beneficial to be able to grow wildflowers in these areas as well. So if you don't have a garden and you're joining because you want to see what you can do, then think about doing this. And, and if you have the uh, ability to put in a planter or, or a flower bed or something on a balcony, for example, but use as poor soil as you can find. It's not that easy because, of course, if you go to a garden centre, you're usually finding um, quite rich compost because that's what they sell. Um, so it might have to be what you can find. It's a slightly different process in planters because you can control much more easily the plants that are growing and weed out the things perhaps that you don't want, like grasses that might come in and set seed. Um, so there are opportunities there. And of course, you know, all the plants that we're talking about really love nutrients. It's just that some of them can't compete with the other ones, uh, so they can't get away. But going back to kind of areas rather than planters, you then want to create bare ground. And uh, normally, you know, we would say you put on some livestock and uh, perhaps uh, allow them to graze the area down and then you would cut it. But of course, if you don't have livestock or the ability to put livestock into places, you're looking at cutting and almost scalping that ground. You want to create at least 50% bare ground. But to be honest, I would be going for 90 because you're creating a seed bed for that seed. And if it doesn't touch bare ground, so if it touches some of the dead uh, grass material, it won't germinate and take root in the soil. So bare ground is essential. And by, you know, I've put on there, create 75%, you know, approximately 75% bare ground. That's if you're standing there and you're looking down at the ground, you can see 75% bare earth. It does look a little bit hideous when you do it, but it's all for good purpose. So that seed can take um, place. So you'd want to cut it and then you wouldn't want to scarify it. And, and I'll be showing you a short film about scarification coming up, but you can hire machines that will do this job for you. Or if you have lots of people, uh, lots of rakes and a bit of a rake action goes on. You could also use yellow rattle to do this as well because that, that, that plant parasitizes grasses. Um, so you could introduce yellow rattle one year and then the following year put in other wildflower seed from a given seed source. So creating bare ground is essential. It's actually the area where we see most people don't achieve what they want to achieve because they haven't created enough bare ground. So please go all out and make sure that you create at least you know, 50%, if not 75 to 90% bare ground. 
then you need to think about how to introduce seeds and where they're coming from. So I've got four uh, areas to introduce seed, uh, different ways of introducing seed. There is a fifth, which is natural grassland regeneration, where you need a donor site next door to a, um, uh, the recipient site, the area that you want to enhance, and you would then open a gate and allow livestock to move the seed through. But in most uh, kind of semi-urban or urban situations, having livestock isn't an option. So I haven't included that here, and I'm not really going to talk about it. Uh, but uh, I did do a how to make a meadow webinar um, a couple of weeks ago, and we talk, I talked more then about livestock. So uh, you can go and catch up on that one as well on Plant Life's uh, uh, YouTube channel. So the four things I'm gonna talk about are green hay, brush harvested seed, using commercial seed mix, and also wildflower turf, and the pros and cons of those four uh, um, types of, of seeding um, method. And the sowing technique, depends on the size of area and the availability of seeds. So as you can see in this picture here, this is green hay that has been cut uh, and it's been put into a dumpy bag to be transferred somewhere else. And of course there's seed sources as well. So I want to go a little bit more in depth into these so that you understand the process and then can think about maybe whether it's applicable to your area. So natural seeding, green hay. Green hay is, for usually forage harvesting a species rich grassland, which is your donor site. And this is a forage harvester attached to the back of this um, tractor here. And it's chucking it into the back of a muck spreader. Now, of course, this is being done on a large scale. Sorry, I didn't have anything on a smaller scale. But if you think back to the picture that I showed you before with um, uh, green hay in a dumpy bag, that's also perfectly possible. So cutting a species rich meadow um, grassland as a hay crop, but before it sets seeds, so this is probably early J June, but of course, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, well, late June, early to late June, it depends on the year. 2020 was a very, very uh, warm year. And so everything matured really quickly. So we had to get out there towards the beginning of June to cut all the, the um, donor sites. Uh, whereas last year was quite late and we were cutting into late August <laughs> to get the seed. Um, and then that, um, uh, green hay is picked up, put in a dumpy bag, or in this case, muck spreader, it could also be bailed. It's taken to the recipient site, which is the site that you want to spread um, the material onto, uh, that has been prepared with bare ground, and then it is spread. So if it's in a dumpy bag, you could just fork it out and spread it across. Uh, clearly a muck spreader for uh, larger areas flings it out the back. It is a clean muck spreader, I will hasten to add. Um, and if you were to bale it, you could put it through a straw strewer or again, baling it and putting it in the back of a, a, a kind of a pickup or something like that to take it to um, the site that you want to restore. And then you can cut the bales open and with lots of people again, fork it out and spread it out. Um, this uh, technique needs to be done quickly. You're looking at an hour, really the golden hour between cutting and spreading. And the reason for that is because this cut material, green hay, heats up really quickly. And that over time makes the seed become infertile. Um, and the heat, it doesn't like heat. So if you're looking at finding a, do a donor site nearby, it needs to be quite, you know, within an hour's transport of the recipient site, half a day at most and then you need to get it out. So the logistics have to all be set up beforehand, um, but it's often the cheapest um, option for you. Uh, you know, on average, it take, it's, it's uh, 400 um, pounds per hectare of restored grassland. How much green hay do you need? It's a one to three ratio. So if you have uh, one hectare or one acre of donor site, you can spread it on three hectares or three acres of recipient sites. So actually you don't need very much if you're talking about a small patch, but trying to find that donor site is the key bit and uh, uh, kind of matching meadows together, looking at the um, similarities between the donor site and the recipient site is a really key thing because you want to make sure that the pH of the soil is the same so that the, the plants will all grow. So that's 
green hay. Another technique is called brush harvested seed. This is a bit more costly. It's usually around eight to 900 pounds um, per hectare of restored meadow. And the reason for that is because you need some specialized equipment, which means getting a contractor in. Uh, but there are seed suppliers that will sell brush harvester seed that they have gone and taken from areas. So a brush harvester is what this machine is behind the truck. It's a um, wire brush really that sweeps across the top of um, uh, the donor site and picks up the seed um, in its, its green state. So it's, it's, it's already been set, but it hasn't dropped from the plants just yet and puts it into and sweeps it into a bag at the back. That bag is then emptied out. Usually it's sieved as well to get rid of the um, dead, uh, you know, the unwanted grass stalks and leaves that are picked up by the brush harvester too. And that material can then either be used fresh like green hay and taken to um, the donor site straight away, or it can be laid out somewhere in a barn, in a dry place and turned over and dried. And that means that there is more time between harvesting and spreading. So it relieves the logistical issue of having to get the material somewhere as quickly as possible. Um, but, you know, the, the catch with this is trying to find someone with a brush harvester as well as a donor site. So you might actually be looking at buying in a seed mix to do it. Um, Sorry, the next uh, one, which is probably the one which is uh, most useful in uh, and applicable to the situations that we're talking about for making a mini meadow is actually to put in a seed mixture. Um, and seed mixtures can be bought all over the place, but I would urge you here to think about using and trying to find seed mixtures that are local to the area. And the reason for that is because we're not just doing this to create a wildflower meadow most of the time, we're also looking at all of the insects that perhaps use that wildflower meadow. And there's a growing body of evidence now that says that um, local is better. So seed from plants that are growing locally tend to be better adapted to the local environment, to the local microhabitats, and insects tend to be better able to use those plants. So um, it's worth looking at where that mixture comes from. And um, I think Felicity is putting some stuff in the chat, um, which, uh, and we've got some, um, uh, a directory of kind of places where you can go to buy wildflower seed. It's usually the most expensive. Uh, you're looking at what if, you, you know, if you buy, um, wildflower seed with grass in it. Uh, usually it's 80% grasses and only 20% wildflower mix. So you may want to just use wildflowers. But if you were to buy a mixture with grass in it, uh, you probably want to sow something like four grams per uh, meter squared. Uh, so that adds up quite quickly. Um, whereas if you want to sow a mixture with just wildflowers in it, you want one to two grams per meter squared. Um, I would look at that, uh, uh, you know, what you want to achieve, because grasses do tend to come in naturally anyway. So perhaps just buying uh, wild flowers and, the, you know, the, um, rather than a mixture might be better and thinking about what you can, um, you know, what species you want to come uh, grow in your grassland. Um, it's a simple thing to do. You can either use, uh, if for larger areas, you can put the seed through a seed hopper, uh, so agricultural machinery. Um, the issue with that is that you might need to bulk up the seed with something like sawdust, some kind of uh, relatively inert material, because you want such a low seed rate and some seed hoppers don't go down that, that low. But it's perfectly easy to actually sow the seed by hand as well. Or, or to use something like a seed fiddle, which is an older type of machinery, which chucks the seed out uh, in front of you and you get, you get some which you can tow behind you as well. Um, it's quite good fun. Um, so seed uh, mixtures and seed, buying seed is a really um, viable option for small, play, uh, small areas. It's probably the most costly uh, around about um, 1,200 per hectare something like that. It depends on what seed mix you're going for. Um, and then the fourth one that I wanted to talk about is wildflower turf. And um, you can buy wildflower turf. 
it is by far the most costly because you're buying a, something that has already been grown and that care and attention of that um, area. Um, uh, it also tends to be quite generic. So you tend to not have um, the variety of wildflowers that you might want to establish. Um, so there's nothing wrong with buying wildflower turf, but there's just got those two things uh, that you need to think about. You also need to think about the site preparation, which is where you come to stripping soil. And I'm actually gonna show you a case study about that uh, in um, uh, a couple of minutes. Um, but before we do that, I want to show you a video um, about how to um, uh, sow a mini meadow. So um, as you can see, you know, it's a process, it's actually an easy process to do, uh, just um, uh, get, getting all the steps lined up and thinking about it. So I just wanted to talk um, you through um, uh, an example, really, of actually where wildflower turf has been used. And this comes from um, Fermanagh in Northern Ireland. Um, and a, a local community group wanted to, uh, well, actually the local community wanted to put a um, pathway uh, for an open access pathway through um, a wildflower meadow and to do that they wanted to put in um, the uh, kind of the hard standing to make it easily accessible for people and the local school wanted to be involved so this is Ulster Wildlife uh, who set about doing this task with um, uh, the local community and as you can see here the children were helping to design the route through the meadow because they were going to be some of the users. And then they needed to take off actually what the species rich turf is. And so this is them stripping uh, that turf off um, the surface. Uh, and this is a, a turf stripper that they had hired. Uh, they, you know, walked the route and then moved the, um, the kind of uh, lattice work to one side so that they could put it where the community wants it to go. Uh, and as you can see here, this is what it looks like when it's been stripped and they rolled it up. So this is the picture that I showed earlier on. So this is species rich turf that they're taking up already. Uh, they then put the lattice work down uh, after preparing the site. Uh, it looked a little bit messy to start off with, but come the summer, it started to look pretty nice. And so this is late spring, early, early summer at this point in time. But they were left with some rolls of turf and wondering what to do. And the school really wanted to use them. Um, and so the Ulster Wildlife went out and they stripped an area of uh, the school uh, near uh, a greenhouse. And uh, as you can see here, this is what it looked like. They created that bare ground. Um, and then they rolled out the turf on top of it uh, using boards. Uh, and this is what it looked like. So this was the species pour against 
you know, what actually looks like quite a, a mucky bit of turf. And it can look like this to start off with. Um, and this is what it looked like, you know, uh, a few days later once it had started to settle in and bed in. So it can be done and using wildflower turf can be um, something to do. Just be careful that you, you would buy a generic type of turf from um, a supplier. Um, but this was a great way of using it. I want to talk, I, I know it's six, uh, 6.50, and so Felicity will probably be going, you need to stop for questions. There's two things that I want, uh, three things that I want to mention really quickly. And the first one is seed enhancement. So if you already have an okay, you know, slightly floristic bit of um, meadow that you want to put some other species into, you can, with uh, single species actually put in those uh, the seed. And that's by creating small divots, usually using a trowel and sprinkling that seed in there, which is what these people are doing here. And I've done that really successfully um, in Somerset in my local meadow. And we're now starting to see some of the plants coming up like uh, meadow cranes bill um, in a community space that we have here. Um, you could also use plug plants. And plug plants are great because you sow the seeds, you nurture the plants, and then you put them out. Um, I would say that um, if you use plug plants, make sure you mark where you put them because they need more TLC than you think when you plant them out, especially if you planted them out in the spring. And if it's a dry spring, like it has been over the last couple of years, those plants can actually desiccate and wither and die. Uh, so you might need to go back and water them. So just put in some kind of cane or stake. Um, and uh, uh, you may also get quite a lot of um, uh, type of predation from slugs and snails because the plants that you put out are juicy compared to the other things around them. So sometimes slugs and snails come in. Um, so just be aware that you're going to lose some even after all that time nurturing them. Um, I talked a little bit about immediate and first year management. Um, I just wanted to reiterate some of that. So immediately after you sow your meadow or um, you uh, with seed, you would want to roll or press the seed into the soil surface to make sure you've got that contact. And then because normally you sow in uh, late summer, you might need to actually cut the grass again to try and keep that grass uh, level low. Um, and uh, to make sure that there, you know, there is some bare ground and that those seedlings, when they start to germinate, don't get smothered by the taller grasses which are already there. Even though you've created bare ground, if it's already grass and that grass comes back very quickly. Then in the early spring, even in the first year, you may need to mow or cut. Um, and then you'd shut up the, the, um, the meadow for the summer growth season and for flowering. You may not get many species in the first year, but you would hopefully get yellow rattle if you use yellow rattle. And, in, um, and then you would cut the, the um, hay, hay meadow in the summer. Um, and then you would go back to the autumn again and you would repeat that process. So it is very cyclical. It just might slightly alter depending on the weather. And in the first year, you would hope that um, you would have a uh, yellow rattle and um, uh, some other species, but you may not have that many flowering plants uh, because they form that rosette in the first year. You might, though, have oxide daisy, which tends to start, it's a, it's a short-lived perennial, it really likes bare ground. You can get booms of oxide daisy as well. So you might have yellow rattle for the first few years and then oxide daisy might come in. And then you can often see legumes. So bird's foot trefoil, red clover, common vetch or tufted vetch may start to grow because by taking off that grass material, you may actually have lost the, um, uh, the nitrogen from the soil. They're all nitrogen fixing plants. So they want that. And then from seven years onwards, you would hope that it would start to even out and you wouldn't see these booms of different um, uh, species. So uh, nearly there. Um, felicity. Um, so uh, as you can see, uh, the loads of information that I've thrown at you, and I'm really sorry, we normally, like I say, take half a day to, to a day to do, to do this. Um, so uh, there's lots of information on the Meadows Hub, or if you're in Wales, 
uh, Hibdolf. Um, it has been fully translated into Welsh, I've just been told today. Um, so please uh, go to that and have a look. Uh, go and have a look at this recording as well. Um, and uh, I, I would really like to say thank you to the Welsh Government as well, who have funded all of this, and also thank you to Felicity. Uh, and sorry that I've overrun and only left five minutes for questions. Thank you very much, Kath. Um, I think um, that's been that's been use that's been really useful. And um, I think some of the takeaway points there that I put in the chat are know your site. You can nod your head if I'm getting this right. Know your site. Um, you want to reduce the nutrients. Bare ground is important. And you recommend 90% bare ground. If you can't remove turf, think about removing cuttings and also getting yellow rattle in there to reduce the, the grassy, the grassy vigor of the grasses. And um, patience at the end, I think at that diagram where you showed us how the meadow, the young meadow will change and what you would expect to see. Patience is definitely a virtue when it comes to meadow making. If it's okay with people, I think because there are so many questions, I've tried to synthesize them, but we'll perhaps I've, overshoot by about five minutes. Is that okay? I've got one thing that I forgot to mention, which is we are running some workshops, half day workshops on how to create uh, your meadow. And so this is about people who um, are wanting to um, uh, have a little bit more help they are all in Wales, as I say, we're funded by the Welsh Government to run this, um, but we have some spaces on some of the March um, workshops left. So please go to um, uh, Plant Life's website and um, Felicity's got the link, we'll be putting it up um, in the chat and book onto them if you want to come. Um, we are limited in places because uh, we're still uh, bearing in mind COVID and all sorts of things, but also we want people to to be able to get something from the day and create your own meadow restoration plan. This is what you know what we we want to do. So it's about you thinking about what resources you've got available to do that. That link's gone in the chat. So let's get on with these questions. Then we had a question: Can you create a meadow on steep land? Yes, of course. And steep land's quite good, isn't it? Because it tends to be poorer it's, in... It's usually poorer in nutrients because it hasn't been necessarily fertilised in the past, uh, but not always. Um, it can be more difficult to kind of do that scarification. And you do need to be a little bit careful about creating bare ground on steep land because, of course, that mud can wash off. So, so be a little bit careful there, but you can do it. I would suggest if you are looking at doing it on steep ground and you're not going to get machinery up there and it's perhaps difficult to rake, uh, you might want to do the method that I suggested, which is seed uh, sward enhancement, where you uh, create some small divots with, you know, uh, take out um, the top uh, turf and sprinkle some seed in there of your chosen species. It takes longer but it can be just as effective. And it has really worked in my local community meadow. That's great, thank you, Kath. Jill from Anglesey asks, can you grow a wildflower meadow on very damp land? Yes, again, um, you can do. It makes uh, management more difficult because what you don't want to do is to compact that land uh, if you walk across it. If it's really damp, and uh, it's got water sitting on top of it, that perhaps isn't the right place for a wildflower meadow because it's probably getting more into being a slightly wetter area. But if it dries out in the summer, then yes, you can do that. And of course, floodplain meadows, which are areas along rivers, particularly um, if you go to the Thames, they have some fantastic ones there with snakes head fertilities and, and things like that. Um, then they are very, very species rich and they are part of our meadow um kind of assemblage of habitats uh which are great to go and visit and to look at so if you're in some of those areas and you want to go and get some inspiration have a look at say uh Wiltshire wildlife trust i think yorkshire wildlife trust also have some uh beebout so bucks bucks and wildlife trust all of these places have 
uh, floodplain meadows that you can go and look at. There's also the floodplain meadows um, uh, organization, part the floodplain meadows partnership, sorry, um, which has a website online. I'll, I'll put that in the chat in a minute. Uh, very quickly, Kath, Diana wants to know, are there any grasses that don't behave like thugs? Perhaps you could just give us five, give us five. <laughs> okay, um, yes, not all grasses are like thugs. Uh, they can all be thugs in the right environment. Uh, so things like crested dog's tail, um, sweet vernal grass, um, meadow oat grass, love meadow oat grass, uh, which is um, lovely. Um, ah, I'm running. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine start. that's fine we'll move on to the next question we have a question there are. Here. somebody in ireland sorry i've lost your name has an orchard can orch can you have an orchard and a wildflower meadow are they good bedfellows they can be yes yeah so you know none of these are prohibitive i would say if you've got an orchard and you want to create a wildflower meadow be really careful of the roots around um the trees because you don't want to scarify directly by the base of the tree you will disturb those higher level roots and that could actually very much upset the tree and that's not what you want to do um i think the issue the, the biggest issue with orchards is how are you going to manage it so you know are you able to put some sheep in there to um kind of eat it off um and what are you going to do with the apples because a lot of the fruit tends to fall on the ground and that adds nutrients to it so how, what are you going to do? How are you going to get? I mean, you might be uh, able to get all of the apples before they drop off, which is brilliant. Um, but yeah, I've often seen it come a little bit awry because of those added nutrients the whole time. So that is uh, something to think about. Of course, if you have some pigs somewhere, then you can obviously collect the apples and give them to your pigs, which could be quite nice as well. Okay, question about moss. Two questions from Richard and somebody who's anonymous. If you've got moss, should you uh, scarify to remove the buildup of moss? People are saying that they're finding it, that nothing grows through it apart from creeping buttercup. Yes, and they're quite right. And when I talked about um, the creation, so livestock do two things for us in wildflower meadows, which I didn't really have time to talk about. Um, first is that they eat all that top growth in the autumn. So if you aftermath graze, that's what they're doing. The second thing is they disturb that thatch. So thatch is dead uh, or leftover leaf and stalk material and also moss as well. And so having livestock in there kicks all of that stuff up. Now, in a more urban environment or a place where you can't have livestock, clearly we are lacking that ability and the, that extra mechanical thing that livestock do for us. So what uh, we need to do is replicate it. Um, and we would replicate it by um, raking it off in the autumn. So, you, you know, that's either using a rake uh, or if it's slightly larger area, a harrow. And there's different types of rakes and harrows. Uh, so you might, uh, for the grass, want something with more sturdy prongs or you would use a tine harrow. Uh, and for moss, you would want something which, uh, like how you actually saw them raking up the stuff in the video, you might want something which was kind of more springy. Uh, we would also perhaps use a chain harrow uh, on larger areas as well. So again, they do different types of things to the ground. That's brilliant. While we're on raking, somebody asked, we saw you showing us about green hay. Do you remove the thatch after you've distributed your green hay? Should you remove the thatch? So obviously the green, I think the idea here is you put in the green hay, it's got the yeah. seeds, it's got the stalks. Do we just leave the stalks there or should we get rid of them? So um, I probably poorly described that we actually take green hay or brush halves of seed from one hectare and spread it on three hectares. So actually it's quite thinly spread. Um, so it tends not to matter that you're leaving some of that kind of dead material there. And of course, if you try and take it off, that's, you know, if you're taking green hay, that's got the seed attached to it. So you don't actually want to take it off. But what is essential for all of these techniques is making sure that that seed is in contact with the ground. So you need to, as in the video, either trample it in, having a good uh, barbecue after you've done this is a good thing, uh, especially if it's community meadow, you know, uh, get out there and enjoy it. Invite some people over and, and, and you know, do something fun um, to really um, put, you know, push the seed 
onto the soil surface. You don't want to bury the seed because wildflower seed drops onto the soil surface. Um, so in answer to the question, no, it shouldn't matter at all because you're spreading it so thinly. Okay, quick question from Mike Baker here. How long does it take to reduce soil nutrients by frequently cutting and, remove, and, and removing? Is it something I do in a year or do I need to do it for several years before I can start making my meadow? Depends on your starting point. So it depends how nutrient rich the soil is, particularly for phosphate, and it can take a long time. But it may on free draining soil, so not clays, uh, but sandier soils or maybe chalky or limestone soils um, be much, much quicker. Um, so uh, you have to, and unfortunately, we have spread, uh, as, as, as a nation, we have spread a lot of fertilizer on some places, and there will be some places that we never managed to get nutrient poor enough to be able to do this. And if you, on the larger scale, there are things that you can do, but they're done as extreme measures because they're very costly, which is, you know, massive um, topsoil stripping or soil inversion. But even some areas, we can't do that. And the cost is often prohibitive. David and Janet want to know, shall we get started now? Should we start removing our turf now? Is now the time? Um, not for removing turf, but yes, for doing a soil test. February is the ideal time because it's before the growing season. So get out there, get your home kits or take a soil test and, uh, uh, you know, um, send it off to a lab. And that tells you how you're doing it. Now, I would use a home soil testing kit for smaller areas, but for bigger areas and for more accurate measurement, send it off to a lab. When you want to, you want to prepare the sites before or just before you put on the seed. So if you're using green hay, everything needs to be set up in place. Whereas if you're doing um, brush harvested seed or using a seed mixture, you might have a little bit more leeway in the times. Um, uh, someone's just asked, where do you send a soil test to? Um, if you uh, look on the Meadows Hub, we have put some places where you can find labs to, to do that. Uh, I'm in Somerset uh, and I have Mole Valley Farmers not far from here near Bridgewater. So I actually take it into them. Um, and costs vary uh, from about uh, 12 pounds-ish up to about 30, depending on where you're sending it to. Um, so uh, yes, so you'd want to prepare the ground probably in July-ish time. Okay, for the next year? Uh, so for sowing this year, and you'd want to sow the seed before um, the end of November. And the reason for that is that particularly if you're putting in um, yellow rattle, it doesn't have very long seed um, viability. So it doesn't tend to last that long over the Christmas period. It tends to become, um, it, it just, yeah, tends to lose uh, its, its growth. Um, but also uh, it wants a period of cold as well to break dormancy. And something I forgot to say with wildflower uh, using plug plants is plug plants could be really good for species that have um, dormancy mechanisms like hard seed coats. So I mentioned meadows, meadow cranes bill um, uh, and also betony have hard seed coats and that takes a long time to break in the wild, but you can actually slightly scarify them between two pieces of sandpaper, really lightly scarify them because of course you don't want to break off the growing tip um, and the radical uh, and then plant them. And that kind of brings the process along. So uh, in my local meadow, we sowed that wildflower seed probably about six, seven years ago. And last year was the first year that we had meadow cranes bill come up. Okay, so we have three questions here to do with shade. Somebody is almost uh, on the verge of persuading a friend to get rid of their plastic lawn and replace it with wildflower meadow, but that plot is shaded. Somebody else is saying, I've got a shaded plot, and somebody else is saying, I've got a north facing plot, which of course will also be shaded. Can we have wildflower meadows in shady areas? You can do, but it's probably more limited in terms of what plants you would get there. And so, you know, meadows and meadow plants are sun loving. 
but that doesn't mean that you can't you can't not grow them in that environment you perhaps may want to pick the things which are slightly more robust so thinking about having uh common knapweed oxide daisy again self-heal yellow rattle they can all live in that area and it doesn't matter that it's really shady um i would say that sun is better uh you can buy shady area mixes but like i say, said before do look at where the mix is coming from and local is definitely better for wildlife. And so if you're buying it from somewhere, you know, somewhere further afield or it's a really generic mix, it may still not actually do what you want it to do because you don't know the conditions that that was grown in. So yes, it's, it's more tricky is what I would say. Okay, and actually you've just answered Marieka's uh, question there, which was about local seed mix definitely local mixes are better um if you can get them yeah, okay yeah, absolutely someone's just said uh, they thought that early early april is another chance to sow seed yes you're quite right uh you can sow seed um uh in very early april um but uh the better results is particularly for yellow rattle as i say said i if you do it really before November so you know when you cut the the green hay um if you're doing green hay or it tends to be well it can be from early June onwards depending on the weather um so you want to do it before over that period of months the optimum time I suppose and the time that most people use seed mixtures um uh, or were to sow seed mixtures would be um uh, kind of September October time Okay, so we're going to take two more questions. If people want to copy and paste the chat, they can. I will try and get those links to you, but it'll be next week because I'm on leave now. Nora, I have to ask this question because Nora is dialing in from Seattle. Uh, what, can she, what can she do to get started this spring on her meadow? So that again is about uh, definitely doing a soil, a soil sample and preparing the ground. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I can't help you with what mixtures would be suitable in Seattle. I think that you're going to have to contact some of the local organisations out there to find out what would be local and native to that particular area. But yes, it's the same all everywhere in terms of actually trying to repeat this process. So the process is the same. It's the species, the plants that you want to put in there and how they they uh, work within that local environment that will change. So I would still advise, if you can, trying to do a soil test um, and, and, and going along this process. A quick, uh, quick question from Helen, who wants wax caps in her lawns. How is she going to do that? And that is, they tend to be on mossier, mossier lawns don't they and we definitely don't want to be using any chemicals on our lawns no and um they are really really difficult so what we see for wax cap grasses the, the mushrooms are the thing that spores so they're they're the fruiting body as we would call them and of course you know i talk about mushrooms but actually they could could be corals and all sorts of things um and i know people who are are far better than i am at uh, wax cap grasslands and know far more than I do who have been trying to establish wax caps in their lawns for years. It's very, they're very difficult to transplant. They don't like any disturbance at all. They want very particular management um, uh, that uh, they want, uh, uh, you know, so that, yeah, no disturbance, low nutrients, um, but they also want cutting at the right time as well. Um, we have some information on wax cap grasslands, which I'm not sure if Felicity is able to, to, to find and put it on cool. there. Um, and we have some leaflets as well, but we do quite a lot um, on that uh, particular subject because they are missed so often because we look at the wildflowers and then we don't go back out in the autumn and look for the wax caps. Um, so it's not impossible, but it is quite difficult um, to actually to, to establish them somewhere else. Um, join, uh, if you are a Facebook member, there is Waxcap Watch, which is a group that you can join. And there's 
it has a membership of nearly a thousand people now and they're people who take part in the wax cap app survey which is a citizen science survey that i mentioned um but also they post lots of things about wax cap so it's got a it's got its own group now uh going okay i have two more questions we had someone are there any plants that are better if i want to create my mini meadow in a planter are there any sort of particular seeds that are better um I would go for things which are really showy and you know I would think about growing them as plug plants and then putting the plug plants in there so that you can give those plants some undivided attention I mean, it's up to you how you want to do it I mean you can sprinkle seeds but if you've got a planter then it tends to be that you're looking at the more tidier side of things I would just go for wildflower seed I would not use grasses at all and I would think things about you know again common nap weed um oxide daisy uh self-heal you could uh look at uh things like some of the scabiouses as well uh field scabious uh maybe even devil's bit scabious um which i mentioned earlier on um if it's uh, an area that you can keep slightly damper maybe has more acidic soil you might want to think about some including something like ragged robin okay and then the last one from jan uh for sandy, quite rich soil in coastal areas, do you have a seed mix? I mean, are there coastal area seed mixes for? There are, yes. And um, in that particular situation, you would perhaps want to look at things that were more tolerant to salt. Uh, so uh, things like thrift, I call it sea pink, sorry. Um, but maybe even sorrel and other stuff as well. Um, but you can get a huge, you know, if you go walking along the coast path, um, you will still find all of the things that we tend to find elsewhere. They tend to be a little bit smaller um but you can get a particular suite of uh kind of coastal plants which includes thrift that um are much more suited to that environment you tend to actually if, if you're on shingle areas find more annual species as well um uh and you know that might just be the way that you have to go okay Kath, thank you very much for, and everybody who's still here, thank you very much for staying on. Kath, um, I've really appreciated it. I've learned a lot. I can see in the chat that lots of people have too. Plant Life's Meadow Hub is a good place to go uh, for more information. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us tonight and helping uh, hopefully going off now to help us achieve our plant life vision of a plant rich, a world rich in plants and fungi. So we want lots and lots of meadows popping up everywhere. So thank you very much and good night. Yeah, not swift, ah. <laughs>